You know, I have the answer. Like, fat girls and I get along pretty good, and then also. Okay. Uh, like, uh, why did you uh, uh, move to the Texas scene? You know, something like that. It wasn't a scene. <laughs> I got here. Well, all, it turned out me and Willie and Murphy and uh, them we all got here at the same time. Well, it was it was like within six months. All right. And then. Uh, oh, are you talking about now? Is that the first question? Yeah, that's going to be like the first question. All right. Did, did, so we could re restructure that question because you actually created a scene when y'all got here was the, before the progressive country. And sure. they progressive yeah, country. we were here before. Yeah. Uh, so what we could do is that you want me to ask you about the Texas scene? You said, well, I was here before the scene. All right. All right. Well, say, how did the Texas music scene come about? You know. Right. right. Just one thing. This is covering your eyes up. You can see on here. Is that that's all right. They'll have to come out and see me in person to see what it is. If you're right. happy with that, that's fine. But some right. people. Yeah. I know. They, they always do that, but I. Do you, I mean, do you want to be lit from underneath so you can see your face more? Yeah, this I'll squint, it. probably. This has got it. Okay, you do whatever you need to do. I, my hair is... You can still wear your hat and that'll work out just fine. All right, see, that's got that shadow right there. Right here. Don't you watch... Slightly so don't. you can get more of the... The, ba of the painting? Side. Yeah, that side. Well, there's lumps in the couch okay, and that seems to be a better, better lump. Let's move the couch a little bit. Yeah, it's got a. Yeah, it's, true. It's, it's got one spot. It seems you want to gravitate okay, towards. That, that will give you a. Oh, okay. How's that? Cacti in the background. I'm about to get fried by that. Is that got to be so bright? Yeah, that has to be so bright. And I'm gonna make sure it doesn't wash me out. I always think TV is overlit. Personal opinions. Okay. All right, that looks pretty soft, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Softer. But do you like that shot? song that probably says this whole thing. I could sing it in two and a half minutes or three minutes. Say all that this interview is going to take. Huh? It's called Lay My Life on the Line. It's just kind of about what we do. I know there's people who just sing. What they do is a whole different thing. But it's more than a business. If you stand as a witness, lay your whole life on the line. I'm laying my life on the line. That's what I do all the time. I go out there each night. Standing in some white light, lay my whole life on the line. If music is my way of life, traveling gets crazy sometimes, but it takes me places. Where I see the faces People I touch with my lights and Sometimes it all feels so good Sometimes I just feel far from Sometimes I wonder, now where am I headed? Have I been on this road for too long? Now here I am out here tonight Playing the song that I write 
While the magic ain't singing It always comes when you're bringing Your whole life laid out in lines So I'm laying my life on the line And that's what I do Thanks. Right. Like right. Yeah, that's a Check good one. They say there's a satellite out there you can bounce a signal clean off and back and get the Jeffersons three times a day. But there's nothing as pretty as this yodel coming back off that mountain. It's just kind of the, because they're emptiness way out there. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I like the winds when you can hear them coming and you're standing there and all of a sudden they hit you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that feeling. Yeah. All right. We may get some. Okay, we're rolling, Michael, so I just... All right, the Texas music scene, is, as I became involved in it, started in about 1971, late 70, I drifted back from I was living down in Key West, Florida, doing, having entirely too much fun and not getting enough creativity done. And I felt I wanted to put a band together that played and sang my music. It wasn't a studio band just picked to accompany the songs. They just played and sang, did harmonies and all that. And I'd always remembered that Austin, in the early years when I was here, was a town where you could play your music. They didn't care whether it was a hit song or just something you just wrote. They could sit around, have a beer, listen to it, and judge whether they liked it or not. If they plotted real hard, you probably done it good. They kind of just yawned through it. They probably weren't doing it so good. So I liked that. We could come back here, make a living, play our music, and just, I think, I've been thinking about today when I knew I'd be talking about it, that a Texas artist, or at least the ones that I've known here, are pretty hard on themselves. They'll, they'll be their own worst critics. and. Uh, if I'm going in to listen to another person playing or, or dancing or doing whatever art they're doing here, the theater group is doing something, I'm sure they're doing the best that they can do with it. And uh, they're trying to please themselves harder than they probably have to. And that's what I like about it here. Okay, we're going to have to put a stop on that. Spell that. All right, go ahead, Tim, you're on now. All right. We're going to be asking you, um, uh, how did you come to move to Texas? Mm -hmm. Describe the uh, beginnings of the Austin music scene, which you've already done. I did both those questions in there. Okay, right? yes, right, all right. And then those both were the first two, so it works out. Talk about the Austin uh, the scene now. Okay. I'll okay. the next one after those. Okay. All right, and uh, are you aware of any new acts? Are you seen bands like True Believers and stuff like that? I haven't really kept up with it. I mean, uh, somebody was telling me about Dino Lee the other day. <laughs> Said I had to go. So I didn't catch that one time. Yeah, one time. I think it was something right after a night. Somebody said. They want to know more people that you are more. Oh yeah, okay, younger people around like David Halley and that you sort know, of stuff. Anybody that you think that you like, it doesn't uh -huh. matter who it is. Um, Nancy Griffin, she's a nice. Yeah. Causing a lot of people attention. It's nice to see people demand, like a guy called me from Louisiana tonight to get me to come and play a little club and he was trying to get like David Halley and Nancy Griffins because he traveled down here to the Kerrville Folk Festival to see the acts and he was impressed and that's uh, that's what he likes. Yeah, it's nice. And then they'll ask you, uh, how did you meet Hondo Crouch? Okay. Well, okay. And um, what makes uh, the Lickerbach a special place to you? Um, how'd you buy, how did you meet Guy Clark? I named it. How does it feel to play with uh, Willie on the 4th of July uh, in his festivals? Okay. Anything else you want to say about Willie? Okay. Um, comments about Buddy Holly, and then we'll go to like Roy Orbison. Um, any uh, Texas blues in general? Any other people that you um, like in the Texas blues scene? Not just there necessarily in rock and roll or, or country or country. And then what you think about Stevie Ray Vaughan? You know? Hey. And uh, if you have anything you want to say about Farm Aid, all right. Um, 
Yeah. Wish I could have been here. Can you sit there and do it so that you see? Yeah, I will. Okay. Imagine oh, I'll look cool. What you're doing now so that you can uh, kind of uh, say in several days after. Right. Am I looking um, too much that way? No, it's not. No, you weren't too much at all. It was good, but I was just trying to touch perfection. Might as well be. Anything worth doing is worth doing. I always say overdo it, but uh, do it right. Right. Um, uh, do you want me to do one of the questions now? You, you like to detect the sound right there, and uh, um, how does it come? Um, how did it come about? How did the Texas sound come about? Like this, I guess progressive country when you started out that sound, the Texas. Oh, sound. I hated that name. Yeah, I know. That, I don't want to say that, but I'm sorry, I guess that's what they were talking about. The yeah. Sound, the Texas sound is what they called. Well, like let's do this. Let's well, let's do Hondo and Lukenbach first, because that's part of the reason I came back to Texas. When I got where I, why I live as close as I do to, to that side of town. And right, they'll be able to edit this anyway. So whatever way oh, you okay. put the answers, they're going to go in and edit All it right. anyway. So it won't matter. Um, I'll, I'll start in right now then. All right, great. Let's just go right on back to the beginning. Of this okay. Right. Let's see how many. We're about halfway through this tape, and what we'll end up doing is having about uh, half of these questions on here, and then we'll go to each other. Okay. Okay, well, about 1970, I... Uh, I flew out to New Mexico to play, uh, spent about a month out there with some friends out in a, a dude ranch and, uh, and, and play some music. And uh, while I was there, uh, Alan Damron, I was a Texas folk singer and, and uh, entertainer, had passed through. And he told me that Hondo Crouch had, had bought, uh, bought Lukenbach, Texas to uh, make it his own little place to do stories and regale people. And, and kind of, there was an 1800s town. And, and that I should check it out when I came back through. So I, uh, when I did move back here in, in uh, 71, I headed down to Lukenbach to see what Hondo got for himself. And uh, uh, it started becoming, a, as the scene got more and more active around Austin, we, Willie took off and then Michael Murphy and myself, we were flying out more and more rusty. We were doing the dates. Uh, coming back off the road, it kept, felt good to go to Lukenbach and get an infusion of, uh, of the funk, you know, to sit around and watch old men pitch washers and stuff and, uh, and uh, just depressurize from the road and the fern bars and everything. It was nice to just lay back. And we were talking the other day about doing that, going and getting some highway maps and just traveling the, the little farm road, farm to market roads that are out and back and just go to little crossroad grocery stores and sit around. And it's just nice to keep keep abreast of where, how far away from that we are as we travel uh, in jets and planes and that sort of stuff. Um, let's see. Are you aware of any new acts in the Austin area? All right. Yeah. Uh, I'm mostly in the new. Let's check this audio. Am I mumbling too much? No, it's a, it seems to be. Keep, keep talking. Am I mumbling too much? Are we picking it up? Or are we? The dog outside is probably louder than I am. Yeah, I can close that off there. That's okay. It gives it an air of authenticity. Hello, hello, testing one. I'll do a... Okay. And some of the new people that I've seen in Austin, well, I've been mostly listening to the, uh, to the songwriters, trying to listen around, see who's got stuff going. Uh, like David Halley's a, a songwriter. I'm doing a couple of his songs. Joe Ely did uh, Wish Hard Living Didn't Come So Easy to Me. That was David's song. And I did uh, Rain Just Falls. And, uh, but I like his uh, ability to perform his own songs. They seem well crafted and he performs them well. They're not kind of songs like, well, I don't sing, so they're for somebody else. He actually plays them and sings them, and I think that gives them a more, uh, they're more, more life in them when they're played. And uh, I'll see some other new people around. Uh, I haven't caught Dina Lee yet, but I understand that uh, he's got nice eyelashes. And uh, I'll probably check that. Hey, uh, uh, how did you meet Guy Clark? Um, well, Guy Clark and I go back to, uh, we go back to the early 60s, mid-60s, 64, 65, somewhere around there in, uh, 
Bill Sam Mountain Coffee House down in Houston. Uh, when Houston, Houston was doing pretty good with the music scene at uh, 13, 13 floor elevators there, Rocky Erickson and that. And uh, when the Austin season, we would go down to Houston to play or up to Dallas and back around a little circuit. And uh, I started staying with some friends down there and I crashed on his couch and Guy was making guitars downstairs. And so uh, uh, Guy and I started swapping stuff. He was a expert finger picker and a good good entertainer and a craftsman you know how to make guitars. And uh, he was kind of fascinated by me and Towns and Zant writing songs and we said, it's a hard, just go ahead and do it. CG and a greasy D. Say what's on your mind. How were you involved in the Los Gonzo band? Well, the Gonzo band, I put the Los Gonzo band together when I first, after I got back here, in fact, they were factions of them that were all around. Gary Nunn and Bob Livingston were playing with uh, Michael Murphy at the time. And Gary Nunn had called me up uh, and said uh, they had free time. They were just playing occasional gigs with Murphy and that if I was doing anything, and I said, well, I got a bunch of songs that I've written and I wanted to work up with the group. And why don't we uh, get together? And then from that, we picked up, uh, oh, John Inman joined us along the way, and Donnie Dolan on drums, and uh, uh, we kind of, the Lost Gonzo was uh, taking an unknown thing to an unknown place for a known purpose. That's kind of what we felt we, would, we were doing. And uh, people ask us why we're called the Lost Gonzo Band, because we managed to get lost at least once a day, somewhere. How does it feel to play with Willie at the 4th of July picnics? Uh, the 4th of July picnics kind of an institution down here, and it's, uh, it's just kind of a chance for everybody to get together, see what changes have gone on within a year's time, and uh, everybody to go out and just uh, do the Texas thing, you know, people with the bandanas and shirts off and long neck beers and girls and halters and people on each other's shoulders and and backstage, it's kind of like everybody, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, see if you count, count heads, see who's made it through another year of uh, road warriors. It's fun. It's good music. You got some comments about Buddy Holly? Well, Buddy Holly affected me probably, uh, I'd say like it did most people, the Beatles, all, the, all down the line have admitted that I think that Probably in the 50s, uh, there was Eddie Cochran, there was Buddy Holly, Gene Vincent, uh, the Everly Brothers, Elvis, of course, but they were kind of, it was coming from the same place. And so if you were in London, England, or, or Detroit, or Dallas, Texas, or wherever, you heard those same records. And the, the spirit from the records probably caught most of us. It's that kind of, geez. I think me and my friends can almost play some of that. And uh, it was straight ahead music. And that was, it's simple. Simpler to understand and to, to feel it when you played it. You said, yeah, it hits a chord within you when you're playing it. And you go, this is, I think John Cougar does that exactly right now. He's, his songs seem like four or five friends getting together and just laying down the tracks and sticking with it. And that's kind of our philosophy of doing it. Just, I don't tell the guys in my band what to play. We, I lay the song down, I lead it emotionally, and they, I just say, I'll meet you at the other end. What about Roy Orbison? Roy Orbison. Um, a tradition. Uh, Roy, oh, I guess I should start that. Uh, Roy Orbison is a tradition, and uh, we've been listening to him from that same pocket that was uh, the Everly Brothers of the Buddy Holly, and uh, sort of showing us how to get it done. What about uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan? Oh, well, hearing Stevie Ray Vaughan, it uh, takes you right to the the essence of uh, the blues and get you know he, he's absorbed it so well it's just coming out like he doesn't it's his own now and that's that's the thing about music is when you're you've spent enough time absorbing it and learning it and you stop playing other people's music and pretty soon it's just now it's your music and. Uh, the, all the influences that are around you begin to kind of meld together, and it's, it's now your sound. It's your guitar, your amp, your voice. Um, 
Willie has that sound with his guitar and amp. Stevie Ray's on that same level up there. <laughs> what about the Texas blues in general? Okay. Well, Texas blues, uh, I'd say the blues scene is probably as strong as in Texas, is stronger than anywhere else. Uh, I think it's probably because the, mm, the rough side's a little more prominent in the Texas life right now. I mean, the city's getting more and more sophisticated. I don't know how this, the urban scene is for country blues singers or that kind of blues style, but it, um, it seems like people in Texas can relate to it better. And that's probably helping that, that music scene. Do you have any comments about the um, farm aid? <sighs> well, the farm aid picture is, uh, I think Willie's done the right thing just by doing it to get people's attention, get people just talking about the situation, how it can get so far offline. I, I think that the great big farms have, talk, have steered farmers into buying more and more big machinery to get it done, and that they're more and more in hock to that, for that style of farming, and I, I think that there'll be some look at also returning to simpler forms of farming so that the farmer is able to do with what land he can or less with equipment that's owned by the bankers. That keep, you don't want to get in. What we didn't get to is this camaraderie. What is that word? Camaraderie. Camaraderie. Okay, that's one of the next questions that we'll be coming to about the camaraderie about the Texas musicians. Oh, okay. I got a good story about that. Right, right. Well, like if Texans, if Texans will be on a show together, another guy will go out and say, you know, hey, have a good one. Leave a hole for me to follow. You know, like uh, because only it only gets higher. You know, and nobody's, everybody's different. That's the thing. Once you get to a certain, if you are what you are, you can't change it, and you're going to be different than whoever somebody else is. And, Right, because you, you think your voice, and everybody can tell your voice, no matter where you hear it, it's so different. Nobody else has your voice. <laughs> yeah, it should be that way. Nobody else should have your style of guitar playing either. Yeah, I mean, when you do play it. Just, nobody really does do it. That's why it's important. Well, maybe we can get in to make that into a thing about that's why it's important for the musicians to be themselves when they play. You know, as you as they clean up artists, they take their guitar playing away. They try to get them to redo vocaling till they start so not sounding like themselves. And pretty soon when you do that, then you start homogenizing that music down, you know? I mean, it's, it's your guitar player that the lead guitar player plays off of, and it's all... And they get to the session, they go, well, we'll put another guy to play your guitar, because you play kind of funky. And, uh, whatever. All right, well, let's start out with that first thing. About okay, that. I got a place to start there. All right. Yeah, uh, Doug Simon and I, the other night, were talking about going over to... Uh, well, going to Europe for a little while together, just because we hadn't, and uh, we were just commenting how the music business, since we've been, since day one we've been in this business, some of you've been trying to tell us how to do it, you know? It's like, uh, there's no telling what kind of music we probably would have really played if we'd been left alone. You know, that's probably what helped Buddy Holly was, he was way out there in New Mexico with a four track and nobody was telling him how to do it. The guy in the studio said, it's running, you play. Time's up, I'm sorry, that's all we've got time for. And <laughs> we'll do that question again, I guess, obviously. Okay, you have Sorry about that. That's all right. We got this call this afternoon. All right. We rolling? Yes, go right ahead. Uh, Doug Sam and I were having a conversation uh, the other day about how uh, um, people, since we've started, have been telling us uh, what we're supposed to be doing. Like, you get a lot of advice now as what changes we're supposed to be making. We just decided we'd just keep playing music the way we're doing it. But since day one, we've always been told what we should be doing. 
and we figured out probably our reaction to that has caused us to take different routes to try to find ourselves. Uh, the frustration of not being allowed freedom has forced us to do other things, to seek it out. And probably if we'd just been left alone, there's no telling what kind of music we would have made. And uh, uh, it probably was much simpler at the beginning because people were just turning on machines and letting people play. I mean, uh, they always told me that old Jimmy Rogers, the original country singer, was, uh, they were just looking for somebody like that to record. They weren't sure. They just sent a tape recorder down to the fields and had him sit up and play. And, you know, since that point, somebody's had an opinion about what they should be doing. I always tell them, get your own band, you know, and go do it. And, and uh, that's kind of what I'm doing. If you just leave me alone and let me play it, I'll let the people decide whether they like it or not. And, uh, and there's enough of them that like it from, to keep me happy. How did you meet Hondo Crouch? Oh, Hondo Crouch. Hondo and I, uh, uh, I was playing a club in, uh, in Austin about 1964 or 5. And uh, I'd just written Bojangles. And uh, I was performing it there. And uh, uh, Alan Dameron was opening for me. And uh, he said, boy, you got to Hondo's here. It was like a little vibe went through the crowd. And uh, they said they got Hondo up to do his his imagineering, and he got up and told some stories and sang a couple of Spanish songs. And uh, when he got through, uh, he liked what he heard of my songs, and he said, why don't I come down to the ranch sometime, and he gave me directions. And I drove down to his ranch in Fredericksburg and spent uh, two, three days for the first time. And I was regaled by his storytelling and his uh, the twinkle in his eye and all that stuff, and uh, I was captured, and I enjoyed spending time with Hondo and, and going that part of the country a lot, the hill country. I won't point, I'll try to tell you it's the hill country, it's down 290 west. And uh, uh, Hondo was good for me when I came back to Texas, he kind of helped me loosen up a little bit. And uh, When we talk about the uh, Luca Bach again, and then this different life, Oh, and, uh, yeah. Well, that leads us to Lukenbach, and uh, yeah, Hondo had found the town, and he wanted to keep it uh, functioning, and not make it like a museum that you came to look at, but have people just come there, play music, sit around, tell stories. And the thing that's nice about it is the fact that uh, you're doing it in a real place. It's not like going to Disneyland and sitting in an old store. It's kind of like going out in the woods, driving through the countryside, seeing the people. And it's good for the people that live out there, too, because there's it's nice to see long hairs and old farmers and uh, blue haired ladies and little kids and dogs and everybody running around and playing together and uh, people find out a lot about each other that way and uh, it's, it's, it's people entertaining each other which is uh, it's nice to do. It keeps everything from coming over the tube or you know that, that people are entertaining to each other and that's refreshing. Talk about the Austin music scene one more time. Okay. The earlier one or the, yeah, the new like one? Like you did the first time around. Oh, done. okay. The new, new or old scene. All right, go ahead and go with the new and then maybe go to the okay. old one and go to the new one. All right, well, I'll, I'll just make a comment on where the music scene is right now is that uh, in Austin, uh, it was a good environment uh, financially for artists to live. It was a Austin six or seven years ago was the cheapest city in the United States to live in. Clean air. Uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't until the microchip boom put us on the map that we started driving the prices up and that changed the artist's perspective of how he could live here. I mean, uh, we didn't always need to go prove ourselves in LA and New York all the time to make the money. Uh, we were living nice lives right here, raising children, having fun, being, you know, and since we are critical of ourselves, I think we were making as good of art, art as we could. Uh, besides, when you go to LA and New York, they want to change you. So we were doing what we felt was the right way to be expressing ourselves here. It was a good environment to live in and, and do it. And um, uh, it's still ongoing. We're just trying to find new avenues to keep it alive. Uh, one of the things to get the city to come out and embrace the community a little more, get them to uh, 
give us breaks as businesses like they do any other thing. Uh, cities will give baseball teams a stadium. Uh, they can certainly give the music business four or five warehouses at, at cheap rent. And uh, in there we can have our studios, have some film equipment. Uh, uh, it keeps it again from having to go through New York and LA and become homogenized. If it was done here, it'll have that local feel and uh, Texas has its own way of doing everything. And that's good. Do you have something else you'd like to just say to about a couple of other things that we didn't touch on? Um, let me see. Living in, uh, living in the 80s, I guess, making music. Uh, I think there's going to be a return to, uh, I just went out and did a few shows with John Prine on the road and it was interesting to find uh, a nice solid following of people listening to lyrics. We just did them solo. I uh, went out and played. That was a nice change uh, from the honky tonks. And uh, I think uh, people are interested in, in coming up close to uh, some real lyrics uh, presented in a fashion that doesn't have anything to do with smoke bombs or laser lights. Uh, and, and being surprised how much it can touch them and what a good time they can have. Uh, three, four, five hundred people at a time in a room like that. I like it personally traveling because it's kind of a low-key way of going through it without the whole bus tour and, and the hotel scene and the entourages and all that. It's, it's kind of a nice way. I, some, I read and write as I go along and kind of become more reflective and I, I, uh, I like that. And uh, I think that there's a, there's a need for it, there's a place for it. I'm surprised the college campuses haven't caught on to it yet. I mean, they're, they're learning about everything else. Uh, why not bring some of those artists around, uh, Randy Newman type, Van Morrison, uh, in, a, in a more of an acoustic setting. I don't know where acoustic music stays. I know John McLaughlin went around and played some tours with the acoustic solo instruments, but I know the new age music is sort of tapping that, but it's, somebody said it's kind of sort of like Muzaki kind of. It's moody and it's re relaxing, but uh, a folk music of sorts has, has an opinion, definitely, and it, uh, the, the protest song movement was about singing about things on our mind. If you have something that you want to say, uh, the early street singers were about that. They went around and sang what was going on in the community's mind and uh, sang about it in song and stuff. And so uh, I think that that's kind of, that's how we can feel. That Bob Dylan tapped that when he came, was doing Blowing in the Winds and Masters of War and that sort of stuff when we had the, the, uh, the protest movement, so to speak, of the 60s. And, and there's a lot of anxiety in, in Americans today trying to live at a very high, tense level. And uh, uh, they had to bring in mechanical drummers to play music frantic enough to keep them enjoying it. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I think that there's a need for uh, people expressing what's just on their minds and their music. And uh, I'm a storyteller, that's what I do. I'll play you one. We hear an old freight train, they'd have to go. He said he'd been blessed with a gypsy bone. And that's the reason, I guess, that he'd been cursed to roam. He came through town back before the war. They didn't even know what it was. Looking for. He carried a tattered bag for his violin. It's full of lots of songs of all the places that he'd been. He talked real easy, he had a smiling way. He could pass along to you when his fiddle played. Making people drop the cares and Come out loud the tunes that his fiddle bow. The people there began to join that sound. And everyone in town was laughing, singing, dancing round. As if some tune 
some magic riots. It said this world is happy tonight. Music changes time, time as we know it. Fiddlers, I caught a lady there. She had that rolling, flowing, dangling kind of hair. He played for her as if she danced alone. He played his favorite tunes, the ones he called his own. She alone was dancing. Played until she was the last to go. He stopped and packed his case and he said, Take her home. And all the nights that passed, the child was born. And all the years that passed, then love would keep them warm. And all their lives they'd share a dream come true. All because she danced so well as fiddle -tune. state. That's great, Dan. Do you want to play one more for just a shorter one? <laughs> no, I was real smoked out by that one. I was I thinking about all the musicians that have probably drifted into Austin and found a woman and married them, had babies and stayed. And, and, uh, it's kind of made everybody be having attention on Austin what it is now. Yeah, and then if, then if we're going to have kids do it. Billy Joe Shaper's kids in his own band, and uh, Gary Dunn. I was over with Gary Dunn's baby the other day, and, and that was nice. My little son's named Django for Django Reinhardt. And I got him and Stefan Grappelli together at the Nashville airport about a month or so ago. I saw Stefan Grappelli just sitting there. I said, do you want to meet another Django? And he said, little Django. He picked him up, sat him on his knee. It was great. We got a card from him and I enjoyed running into him. And we sent him some pictures and asked him to send us, because uh, we had the camera, and uh, asked him to send a little beret. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, the cycle goes, and you begin to see generations of them, you know. And um, I think, you know. In Texas, that's the thing about music. It's always going hand in hand with life. It's not we do work and then we go out and see entertainment. Uh, in Texas, uh, it's very common. I mean, like uh, lawyer friends, doctors, whatever you do to, to get away for a week and go along to a place like Lukenbach and pass a guitar around and everybody's just kind of in Levi's playing. You don't know what exactly they do. They may, the music has, is a part of their lives and they like their music to have balls, to be sincere, to be direct. Uh, if you're going to take the time to learn the words to sing to a song, you don't want just... I mean, I hear country fans talking like that. They go, you know, there just isn't enough substance to it anymore, you know, and it's, they, they expect a little more meat to it. And uh, I think in Texas, the, that's, that's there. I mean, we go out and play to people who drive up, park their cars, come in, they're hardworking people, and they play the music, and they want something a little deeper than just the surface thing. And that makes me feel good as an artist to be able to uh, know that something I've worked on real hard, sat around, thought about, and done, uh, it will be appreciated by people on the streets, you know, where I am. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad, you know, that's why I live here. That's it, that was a pretty good rap at the end there, too. Yeah, hey, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh...
They go, somebody go look at all that tape and say, well, God, does some bitch ever laugh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Well, anyway, it's great. I think they, we, I think we got I know they're not going to use it, but about two minutes of it, so <laughs> why, why go on? That's plenty. There's plenty of varieties of stuff there. Okay. okay. Oh, this is great. It's fun. Maybe, uh, I got to go.